If you enjoy content like this, please take a moment to like and subscribe, watch it, and then join the conversation at avnirvana.com. Rolling. All right, so it's going to be you guys. So Getty's approach Sorry. to optimal base. So first, let's talk a little bit about why Geddes would be an authority on this topic. So he earned a PhD in acoustical physics from Penn State in 1982, and he wrote his dissertation on low frequency sources in small rooms. So basically, he was actually looking at how low frequencies operate in small rooms and specifically was looking at things like wall, like what would be the equivalent of wall construction and the low frequency source placement and how it affected mobile behavior. Uh, this was important because what he learned in his dissertation was the importance of the wall construction itself, which affects the dampening of the walls, the impact of having multiple low frequency sources as opposed to the, as opposed to the typical one or two that you would have. And um, probably best of all was he had an appropriate mathematical model for looking at all of this. So um, one thing to think about is why do we care so much about bass? So, Floyd Toole has made a point that the um, importance of bass in our perception of sound could equal as much as 20%, one-fifth of our judgment of sound quality. So that means that bass represents a really large part of how we perceive the sound of a room. Um, it's really important in home theaters. We know this, like watching mic system, going boom, that gets exciting. But in many cases, we don't want to sit in a room and have this seat sound different from this seat or this seat or the ones behind. We want to all have that same experience. So what we hate, we hate when that bass is boomy, when it lacks extension, when there's no visceral component, you can't feel it, and when it's distorting. In fact, while only 20%, which is actually still a good number, of our perception of quality might come from bass, when, uh, when there's distortion in the system from a subwoofer overloading, it can be perceived as, as if 90% of the system is failing kind of thing. Like that small thing can actually make the whole system sound wrong. So, so the first thing we need to know is that this is an important concept because small rooms just suck for bass. That's just straight up something everybody has to accept. And a small room does not mean like a closet or a bathroom. It means any domestic sized space. So they suck for bass because they have really strong modes. These are these reflections that take place off of the walls in a room, which interfere with the sound that we hear at any given position within that room that cause these big, it just wreaks havoc. It causes these really big peaks and dips. And there's things that make it worse, like the walls themselves are uh, very rigidly constructed, which typically causes a relatively higher in the frequency of the bass range, about 65 to 70 hertz peak of absorption. It's a very, very high Q, so it's a very narrow peak. That isn't really of great use to us. Um, and they don't tend to just, they just don't sound good because of all these modes. So Geddes came up with a concept that can best be described as a systems approach. So rather than it being based on some individual principle, he actually developed an entire approach to developing a sound system in a room that maximizes the quality of, of the lower frequencies. And so our preference is going to be for a smooth response, but not a flat response. Now, this isn't something that Geddes invented. In fact, Tool did research on this um, in Canada where he had people sit in a room and listen to different low frequency curves. And they looked to see what kind of a curve people perceived. And it turns out people like a bit of a boost in bass, not quite a bit. Uh, roughly it's one dB per octave from 20 kilohertz, so about 10 dBs in the low frequencies. So we want to have a, a, a decent rise. Um, as I said, Geddes doesn't define this, but I already told you what it really should be. And when I say 1 dB, that's kind of what they came up with. But as we know, everybody's got their own preferences. These numbers actually get hotter yet. They get as high as 20 dBs, where people still consider that to sound smooth and flat. And uh, we all want the same good bass everywhere we sit. So I mentioned nobody wants to be in a situation where as you move seat to seat or turn your head, the bass changes. And that actually does happen in most rooms. So let's talk a bit about room modes, because that's the whole point of the multi-sub approach. So all small rooms have modes below about 100 hertz uh, or 200 hertz in that range. Where they start it is based on this concept that uh, I had mentioned in the last talk. It, there's a st statistical region or a stochastic region in the room where the modes are so tightly placed together that you cannot separate them. So that kind of an area doesn't really count. We don't care about that. Then we get into a region that's kind of a transition zone where it overlaps with the uh, modal region that we're really interested in here. And that region isn't all that well defined. Arguably, it's going to be somewhere between the Schroeder frequency of the room, uh, which is typically somewhere between this 1 and 200 hertz range, and let's say about 5 to 700 hertz. 
but um, the modes we care about are the ones that can be seen as distinctly separated. And so those are going to be largely falling below the Schroeder frequency of the room, and that's why I'm saying somewhere between 1 and 200 hertz. These are, as I already mentioned, these are interactions of uh, they're standing waves. So they're interactions of waves traveling in multiple directions that create a pattern. Um, and so what happens is the sound comes out of the speakers, right? The sound is going to hit that wall and it's going to come back. So some of the sound that's coming from the wall from the speakers this way and coming back from that wall hit each other causes a cancellation. Some of that sound is going to hit the ceiling and come down, that's going to cause a cancellation. It hits this wall, it comes over, it causes a cancellation. They're going to go back and forth and cause cancellations. They're going to go in different angles and come back and cause cancellations. So all of this is what leads to those modes. And those are going to be shown as peaks and dips in the response. And because of where you're sitting, you're going to sit in different areas that are sort of like different hot spots. So this area is going to have a different pattern of peaks and dips than this area. And in fact, if I put a person here, the, the modes that they're going to hear are going to be the same, but which modes are excited depends on where the speakers are placed. So if different speakers are playing in different positions or in different general areas of the room, so when I say general areas, it could be that it's the right speaker, but it could be here versus in the corner, can actually affect which modes get excited here. So because of that, we actually need to come up with a scenario where we're exciting the modes uh, more uniformly, as many as possible. Oh, and the steady state concept. So what we hear at low frequencies actually is not direct sound. So at most mid and high frequencies what we hear is primarily the sound that comes from the speakers and everything that hits the walls is perceived as delayed sound for the most part. At low frequencies that's not really true. At low frequencies what we hear as the steady state or the sound that is sort of perceived as if it's the direct sound actually contains all of the reflections that have happened in the room in many cases m multiple times. So let's talk about the steady state concept because that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. Below this uh, FS or Schroeder frequency we can only understand a room by its steady state response. That's that idea I was talking about. So at 100 hertz the period is 10 milliseconds. And it takes 30 milliseconds to register the tone 100 hertz. So in a small room, the sound would have bounced off many walls. So the way to think about this is 30 milliseconds is long enough to have already gone all the way back there. It, this is not quite right, but for the sake of argument, a millisecond is roughly equal to a foot. It's actually a little bit less, but we're just going to pretend like that. So if a room is 30 feet long, then the distance between here and there is how long it would take to do that. So in most rooms, which are nowhere near 30 feet long, we're typically talking more like between 50, 15 and maybe 25 feet, the sound can go all the way to one part of the room and come back and still fall within the tone range of 100 hertz. At lower frequencies, this goes up. So you can get a sense of what we mean by steady state and why this is important. This means what we hear as direct sound is actually the room and the source. You cannot differentiate these. And in fact, as I mentioned, at 100 milliseconds, we're talking about 10 or 100 hertz, 10 milliseconds is a period. At lower frequencies, that period becomes even longer. So what that means is that when I say that the most of it is a mixture of the direct sound from the speaker and the room itself, at lower frequencies, it's even more the room than it is the speaker. All right, and this means that the quality of a subwoofer is actually really uh, relatively minor relative to the quality of the room itself. And so differences between su subwoofers tends to be more about differences in how, like peak output and low frequency extension than they are in some other discernible difference. So like we often think about high end speakers sound better than low end speakers and there's lots of reasons why that would be. With subwoofers, every subwoofer really sounds the same as long as it's operating within its linear range. And so the differences we hear tend to actually come from the differences in peak output and the differences in extension and not in some sort of other uh, quality difference that could exist. So in Getty's dissertation, he found that with well-distributed dampening, meaning most of the room had dampening in it, there were no differences found in shape. So what that means is like people often had this idea that if you created a slightly wedge-shaped room with cantered walls, you would like be able to get better modal behavior. He found that if you dampen the walls, it doesn't matter anymore, that that's pretty unimportant. And given that it's hard to construct a room that way and can actually create unpredictable behavior, it's probably better just to create damped walls than it is to create a wedge-shaped room. Um, little can be done acoustically to improve the low frequency response. So what that means is that other than the room ratio, uh, so different room ratios affect the room modes and there are certain ones that help keep them spread apart far enough that you can deal with them more easily. Simply placing treatments in a room doesn't do as much as, for instance, EQ or multiple subs will do. And so what he's basically saying is there's not a lot you can do about this problem if all you're trying to do is throw up some treatments on the wall. And the total number of low frequency sources 
as the total number of low frequency sources decreases, the spatial variance increases. What that means is the less low frequency sources there are, the more variation there is as you move around. So this is really interesting. This means that we don't want spatial variance, right? We don't want to have the base change. And, and I've heard people say before, well, my main listening position is the only one I care about. So can not I just optimize that? Yes, but there's a couple problems. So one is sometimes that one position is just bad. You know, it's like just happens to be a bad spot given where you've placed your speakers. So one thing that multiple subwoofers can do is help reduce that variance so that one spot becomes a good spot. Now another thing is that um, it can actually create relatively large differences over a small distance. So six inches could be enough to show a pretty big difference. And most of us don't sit with our heads like this perfectly. We tilt our head a little bit from one side to the other when we're sitting and relaxing. And so you want the bass to stay constant when you're doing that. Um, so if good bass is smooth bass and rising in level with low spatial variance, how do we achieve that? So EQ is not enough to do that. Uh, acoustic treatment isn't going to do that. But there are some ways we can achieve that. So uh, we could create a completely anechoic space. There would be no reflections that would get rid of it. There's another way we can do this. We can actually cancel through the production of a planar wave all of the reflections. And there is methods for doing that and there's an argument that that's a good thing. Now, as I mentioned, this is Getty's approach. And Geddes and I have talked about this. Geddes believes that's not good because it, he, says, he says that's basically what bass sounds like outside when there's no reflections. So his argument is that we actually rely on reflections for spatial information and we don't want to completely get rid of reflections. So totally canceling all of the modes out by canceling all the reflections makes the room unnatural. But yeah, it's going to be really, really flat and smooth with no variance. So he believes a better approach is the use of, use of multiple low frequency sources that are placed in different areas in the room. And as I mentioned, Geddes discovered this idea in the early 80s, but it really hadn't become popular until Welty's seminal paper, which was published in 2006. So let's talk about how we set this up. Okay, so the real reason everybody came to this talk is they wanted to find out about this. So this is what I do, and Geddes and I have talked about this. This is gonna be, I'm gonna tell you now, I'm not Earl Geddes, I am telling you how I have interpreted his approach with his blessing to a point. But um, there are certain aspects of his method, method that are more conceptual than they are written down. And so I'm telling you some ideas that help you achieve his approach, but he maybe hasn't said this before. So the first one that he doesn't really talk about is where I say model your room in Roo and apply a similar number of discrete subwoofer locations. So Geddes has, in some cases, told people, place your subwoofers here. He says one in a corner, uh, one on a side wall over there, for instance, and maybe like one in like the middle of the back wall. Like that would be an okay location. Or, uh, it, you know, you might have one on this side wall, one on this side wall, and one in a corner. That's another approach. But the reality is he does not actually advocate specific locations for the subwoofers. And he looks at it as you should try different locations till you find the best ones. But most of us have subwoofers that are pretty heavy and we don't want to move them around a lot. So another thing you can do is model your room. It's not gonna be a perfect model and it's not gonna be ideal, but it'll at least give you some ideas of what are some potential good locations, and you start there. But the key is you don't wanna have symmetric locations. So one of the key differences between Gettys and Welty is that Gettys is trying to uh, essentially activate as many different modes as possible. And if you put the subs in, in uh, symmetric locations like corners or midpoints, you're actually activating the same modes. So a sub there and a sub there activates the same modes as each other. So you're not getting any benefit from that. Same with subs here and here. These activate different modes than these, but they're the same modes as each other. Gettys is saying don't do that, and then you activate, essentially, or you excite more modes. So it's a way of being more efficient in the process. Uh, so you play around with that, you model it, you kind of figure out what seems to work best. Once you've placed your subwoofers in these three discrete locations, you need to measure in various seating locations. So in the same, in the last talk, I talked about how you want to measure at all of your prime seats. I don't advocate measuring at extreme seats. So I think that mic seats in, in this particular room, for instance, are not close enough to wall to be a problem. That back corner seat there is probably a little close to the wall and I might skip measuring that for my own purposes. But for the most part, what I would do is start with the money seat here, that's the primary listening position and measure in, you know, maybe I'd do three measurements in this one. I'd move to the left seat, I'd do the same thing. I'd move to the right seat, I'd do the same thing. And I'd move back to the back seats and do that. And I would do that and label each one carefully. And, and as I mentioned before, I often take pictures of the mic locations or try to come up with like a map of where to place them so that I can repeat this when I want to check what I've done. 
So then what you do once you've done those, uh, when you've gotten your measurements with the system, oh, I, sh I forgot to say this. When you do that, you actually want to do that with just your main speakers and no subwoofers playing. The next thing you're going to do is move the mic back to the main position. You're going to add in the first subwoofer located closest to the main speaker. So I had mentioned that he advocates corner placement for one of them, and uh, it's probably a good idea. So you have the one in the, in the corner, you turn it on, and you get the level up so that it's about 3 dBs below the main speakers, because you're going to fill in the rest of that difference as you add in the other subwoofers. And so at that point, what I do is uh, I take measurements mostly from the main listening position, but I might add a couple from some other locations just to get a sense of what's happening when I do that. I play around with the phase a little bit, and the reason is because as soon as that subwoofer goes in, the phase may not be right. I don't mess with time alignment. It's just phase, to, and I go, it's just the flatness of the response, whichever one seems to give me the best integration. So once I've got that right, I add in the second subwoofer, and I get it to the point where it's about two, two dBs louder than it was, and we're maybe like one dB below where we want to be. Um, I usually set the cross, oh, I didn't mention this either. So I usually set my crossover at between 100 and 150 hertz for this corner subwoofer because it's closest to the speaker and you're not probably going to detect its location. As the subwoofers get closer to the listener and out in the room, I tend to lower the crossover a little bit. Uh, Getty's wanted me to point out crossover is the wrong term. Low pass filter. He does not advocate the use of a high pass filter on the mains. He thinks that that's a mistake. And I can explain more about why later, but he this is a huge issue in his opinion that is overlooked. And he, he gets upset when people advocate his approach and then talk about the use of a true crossover with a high and a low pass filter. So I'm going to honor what I said to him, and I'm telling you guys that. So as the subwoofers come out in the room, the crossover lowers. Somewhere like, like if you did 150 hertz here, maybe you do 100 hertz here. As you get farther back in the room, you might go to 80 hertz, something like that. And as I said, you turn them up so that now you're like 2 dBs in, measure a couple locations, check the phase a little bit, make sure it seems right, integrates well. You might mess with the crossover a little bit, although to be honest, it probably won't make a difference. Then you add in your third subwoofer. Say you set the crossover at this point at 80 hertz, and that's probably as low as I would go with the crossover for the most part. And you bring the level up to your desired level. Um, if you have more than three subwoofers, that's fine. You just repeat this process and adjust the, uh, the level differences a little bit to compensate for that. And at this point, what you've done is gotten to a point where everything's set up the way it needs to be. That's where you're going to go back now and do, redo all those measurements you took earlier for the purposes of EQ. And at this point, you also should see a decrease in variance. You're not necessarily going to see a flatter response. You might even see a worse response. That's not uncommon. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why you use EQ. Because again, the goal here was to excite as many modes as possible. So what are some really key points based on what I just described? So we're using what he called pseudo-random locations, but I want to point out pseudo-random doesn't mean like literally anywhere. His goal was about non-symmetric locations that are exciting as many modes as possible. More low frequency sources is better. Now he uses three, but you got to remember, I said at the beginning of this that his approach is a systems approach. And so while we think of low frequency sources as being subwoofers, most mains are capable of being sources as well. And especially if you're buying uh, speakers like Matt has designed, which have large woofers and are capable of relatively low output, uh, those constitute a low frequency source. And the area where you tend to have the most problems is between about 50 hertz and 150 hertz. And so having the most number of low frequency sources in that key range is really what's most important to reducing this variance. And so Gettys talks about using three subwoofers as low frequency sources, but he actually uses his mains, which is up to three additional low frequency sources, which are run full range as part of that. He uses very uh, shallow low pass filters and no high pass filter, as I mentioned. So a lot of times you hear people talk about sort of the standard THX or Dolby approach, which usually relies on a, a Linkwitz Riley fourth order low pass filter and a uh, Butterworth or Linkwitz Riley second order high pass filter. So as I mentioned, Gettys doesn't like that approach. He doesn't use fourth order low pass and he doesn't use uh, second order high pass. He uses no high pass, he uses the natural roll off of the speaker and he uses sealed speakers, his own designs. Um, and he uses a first order low pass uh, and then takes advantage of what would typically be the natural roll off of the subwoofer as well. And that minimizes the additional group delay that can happen from this and in his opinion provides better integration. Oh, and I guess I didn't mention this. One of the key points that comes out of this is that he really doesn't make a big deal about time alignment. He's really more looking at absolute phase and um, steady state response. So here's an example of um, 
what can happen when you start to change the sources. So I've created a little graphic, and you can see the number of low-frequency sources that are changing. So you have the mains, one subwoofer, two subwoofers, three subwoofers, different locations. And you can see how the variance in these measurements at these different locations changes. Now, this is a model. And some of you are probably thinking, well, OK, but that's a model. Is that what really happens in real life? And the answer is yes, this is what happens in real life. But it's easy to show you with a model. So now we're going to look at two different approaches, Gettys versus Welty. So my point with this is not to say, hey, I think Gettys is better than Welty. They're different, and they're in many ways more similar than they are different. But um, the point of this was to show you what happens when you apply the Gettys approach in terms of maximizing the number of modes that get excited, you do tend to see sometimes a little bit smoother response. Now, I gave you an example that definitely is showing the Gettys approach is looking better. But the reality is I could also put together a scenario where the Welty approach would look better. It just depends on the room. And that's why sometimes just playing around with location is a good idea. Gettys approach, I think, conceptually makes a lot of sense. The idea of trying to excite as many different modes as possible makes sense. But Welty's approach works, so maybe it's not the end all. Um, Another thing I didn't mention, but I showed in the diagram, Gettys plays around with height as well as the, so like the X, Y, and Z position basically of the subs. So he advocates moving some of the subs off the ground. So let's talk specifically about the differences that at least have been talked about on the forums and, and uh, you know, in my conversations with Gettys, my read of Welty's work. Gettys uses his mains full range and includes them as low frequency sources, whereas Welty typically uses only the subs as low frequency sources, and there is a clear high pass, so there's, a, there's an actual crossover between the two. Gettys advocates for the three or more low frequency sources. Uh, Welty advocates for four low frequency sources specifically. Gettys uses pseudo-random placement. Welty, Welty uses symmetric placement. So I mentioned already the pseudo-random doesn't mean anywhere. It just means non-symmetric. Uh, Gettys advocates for sealed mains. Welty's approach uh, is alignment agnostic for the mains and subs um, because of the way that he, the way it's being implemented. So uh, Gettys has said, and this is where I sometimes think some of the uh, discrepancies come in to, in the discussion of this. If you're using ported mains, you may want to apply a high pass just to protect the woofer. Now, most uh, base management systems don't allow you to do this, but you can do it with external EQ. What he would argue is that if you have to apply a high pass filter to the mains, you would A, apply a shallow one to try to give it a first order roll off, and B, uh, you would actually make sure that there is significant overlap. So instead of saying you've got 80 hertz as your uh, high pass filter on the mains and 80 hertz as your low pass filter on the subs, you would have maybe like 50 hertz as your high pass filter on the mains and 150 hertz as your low pass filter on the subs so that there's significant overlap. So what about EQ? So I can't speak for everybody that advocates these approaches. I believe Welty does advocate the use of EQ. Uh, I know James, who's in the room, has mentioned that no EQ, uh, but with the advantage of the reduction in spatial variance means multiple subs can smooth out the response and you don't need it. Uh, but Gettys does say to use EQ, and he uses it to knock down the big modes that tend to still be there. Uh, you know, like one of the things that happens, especially at lower frequencies, when you add low fre these additional low frequency sources, is that certain modes, especially that one longitudinal mode, that one length mode, which is often in like the 20 to 30 hertz range, just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So in my system, and you'll see this in the measurements, as I add sources, my mode at 22 hertz just gets bigger. The multiple sources doesn't make it better, and that's because they won't. Multiple sources has nothing, has no effect on that really low mode. So what you got to do is add EQ to knock that back down. So uh, he says, you know, two to three bands of PEQ is probably enough to fix the problem. If you're finding you need to use more than two or three bands, there may be something wrong with the setup and you should go back and play around with it. But I don't know that he would be or I would be against using more than two or three bands if need be. It just depends on the system, what you're trying to do with it. Um, but basically, the argument is if you find yourself very quickly needing to get into five or six or 10 EQ bands, you may want to look at the phase of each sub, make sure that you've got good integration there, that the placement is ideal, that the volume is at the right level, um, because you don't want to try to fix through EQ what you can fix passively. The crossover frequencies that I mentioned are not absolute and they depend on the room. Small differences aren't going to make a difference in the measurements, but larger differences could. And so you may play around with this. It's possible that placing a subwoofer back over there and crossing it over at 100 hertz causes it to somehow excite a mode between 80 and 100 hertz too strongly. And so you might actually apply a lower crossover on it to reduce the way that it excites that mode. 
Um, and then one of the key things to keep in mind is that if a sub is too close to the mains, it constitutes as a co-located source. And um, when the subs are relatively close to the mains anyway, that higher uh, crossover point that I mentioned doesn't tend to be audible. Um, Getty suggests using EQ to eliminate the big peaks. I already mentioned that. Uh, the only so when you look at all the different measurements, I mentioned that we're going to take a bunch in different locations. You'll sometimes see peaks and dips in certain measurements and not others. You don't want to be EQing any kind of peak or dip in the response that doesn't show up everywhere because then it's going to just make it worse. That means you still got some variance, which typically you will. And EQ can't fix problems which change with measurement position. That's what I was just talking about. So basically, if you see things changing around with different positions, then that's spatial variance. The only fix for that is the room acoustics or the subwoofer placement. So how do you EQ? So Getty suggests using multiple measurements taken at multiple listening positions and has never given an exact number. Um, so more measurements equals more room information. And that's kind of more like what kind of time and attention span do you have to deal with this? The more, the better. Uh, avoid measurements that are at extreme listening positions. I already mentioned that. EQ to minimize spatial variance. Do not use averaging. So sometimes you'll see people who will take measurements at lots of locations. They average them all together, and then they EQ the average. So one of the problems with that is that the average can sometimes incorporate information that was actually unique to a particular uh, place, and you'll EQ it out. And uh, it, what happens then is you can make the spatial variance worse. So his approach actually says don't average them. But apply the EQ in a way that lets you look at all of them. And there's some software you can do that with, or you can kind of eyeball it by applying it in Rue and just looking at the different measurements you took with the same EQ to see. And so the reason to do it that way is just because you want to make sure that you don't apply like a drop in the peak that suddenly causes, uh, for instance, a dip in a response in an area that like it, you dropped it there. Excuse me, you caused a dip there and a dip there. OK. Um, so the low frequency problem, one of the things to think about is why we're applying EQ and what we're trying to do. So rooms and speakers are minimum phase, which is why we can use PEQ. So peaks in a response cause ringing, dips do not. And the goal here is to have a smooth low frequency response, not necessarily flat, I already mentioned that. Uh, so one of the things you'll notice in any of these kind of waterfall plots is that anywhere there's a peak, there's a, a ridge that's ringing. So I showed you guys in the last one, this is what the application of EQ does. And you can see, by the way, um, well, I guess you can't really see that easily. But this causes the, the decay to look smoother. Now, something else to think about is uh, room ratios actually have a big effect on the modes. And so this is showing using a tool to kind of come up with what the modes will look like, AMROC. Um, I can show you what the spacing of modes is like and what it looks like in the models as the room's dimensions change. So if you look over here, I go from a, um, so this is a huge room. That's a, a non-optimal room to an optimal room. And this is showing how the modes change in each of those scenarios. So when you use optimal room ratios, you do get a situation that's easier to deal with. So mic measurement positions, uh, as I mentioned, I typically will place the mic in different spatial places within the room near where people sit and sometimes around the head. This is sort of a representation of that, but it would vary. So here was uh, measurements that I took at different locations in the room with no sub, but it's actually a very well treated room with a lot of uh, low frequency dampening spread out. This is with four subs. You can see the variance went down um, and the response shape is a little bit better. This was an analysis of the variance. And you can see that, uh, so up here, there isn't multiple subwoofers operating. So it didn't seem to have a big effect. Actually, for whatever reason, it made things worse a little bit. But it's at one particular frequency. But you can see as we get down here, compared to no subs and one sub, the four sub approach has less variance, except all the way at the bottom there at my, I guess it's 25 hertz, not 22 hertz. At 25 hertz, you can see that the peak just keeps getting bigger. It's showing that the variance is increasing, but it's actually that it just gets louder at the areas where there was a peak. And the last thing is to think about time. Uh, so it's time domain integration. This is the wavelets I showed before. That's what it should look like. That's something I actually, somebody sent me and I saw. And when I started looking at different rooms, I found that while this is extreme, this isn't that far off from what a lot of rooms with subwoofers look like. So I'm not saying that everyone's going to get a room that looks like this with less than 10 milliseconds of delay at the low frequencies. But you want to not have 40 milliseconds if you can avoid it. So even though I was saying time delay is not important, one of the reasons why I was saying, and Getty suggests, using shallow slopes 
not a lot of boost EQ, uh, and no high pass filters is specifically this. That helps reduce the amount of decay in peak energy. I said that wrong, delay in peak energy, sorry. So the conclusion for this is that Getty's approach helps to make better bass. It's not hard, but it's cumbersome. So it's just a lot of measurements and then figuring out how to work with that. And it works with the acoustics instead of against them. So it takes advantage of the room and what it's doing. So I guess outside of that, any questions?